right, let's open our Bibles to the uh, book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 as we make our way verse by verse through the New Testament here in our weekend services. And um, you remember that 1 Thessalonians is probably the first letter that Paul wrote, and 2 Thessalonians was probably written very, very early on, right on the heels of 1 Thessalonians, probably written maybe a month, maybe two months after uh, 1 Thessalonians. And this church... Uh, was was greatly confused about the doctrine of the second coming of Christ. Now, if you would like to start a church fight, if that's on your list of things to do this week, and uh, you want to start a church fight, uh, I know of no quicker way to start one uh, than for you to share your views on the second coming of Christ with another believer that doesn't hold the, <laughs> the same opinion that you have. And uh, you're going to be off in the races, and you're going to have a church split before, uh, before you know it. And uh, for some reason, we, we are very passionate uh, about this subject of the, uh, the second coming of Christ. In fact, when you go home today, just Google, when is Jesus coming back again? And there, there's gonna be uh, tens of thousands of websites that you can choose from. And uh, just start going to these websites. You don't need to read the material. Just, uh, just scroll down uh, to get to the comment section. And it amazes me how the, the supposed followers of Jesus Christ are calling each other morons and idiots and heretics and uh, you're gonna go to hell. Now, if you are wrong about the second coming of Christ, if I am wrong about my opinion on the second coming of Christ, the good thing about that is that you and I are not gonna go to hell. That's a good thing. Good thing is you don't go to heaven because you are right about the second coming of Christ. When the Philippian jailer said to Paul, what must I do to be saved? He didn't say, well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have the appropriate view of the second coming of Christ and you will be saved. That's not what he said. Our salvation is based upon our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we've got these varying views about communion. We've got varying views about baptism. We've got varying views about the second coming. Now, look, over the years... We have had people here in this church that come at this, this doctrine from all kinds of angles. And there have been, you know, guys that have disagreed with me, and I've, I've bought them lunch, and we've gone out together, and I've hugged them, and I've prayed for them. And we are brothers in Christ. It's not even a fellowship issue. We don't have fellowship because we agree on the timing of Christ's second coming. We have fellowship because we agree upon the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we get into chapter 2, we're going to take chapter 2 in uh, probably three bites. We'll probably take three weeks to go through this. And we're just going to begin to cover now these first three verses in our, our session today. Now, even though we have got a variety of, of, of opinions, and we can come from different directions. We have to understand that there are certain things that we know with, I, I think, absolute certainty. There are things that we can be absolutely certain of when it comes to the coming of Christ. I believe that the first thing that we can be certain on is the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come back again. We have over 1,500 prophecies, both in the Old and the New Testament, that talk about the Messiah, his kingdom, his reigning, that righteousness is going to cover the earth like water covers the ocean. Christ is going to come again. Now, there are those Christians that will say, well, look, when we get to these prophecies that deal with the second coming of Christ, these are not to be taken literally. These are allegories. These are symbolic. Uh, this is spiritual language. He is talking about spiritual truths. He is not talking about the literal fulfillment of something that is actually going uh, to happen. Now, I don't know how you're wired. How I am wired is that things have to make sense to me. If things don't make logical and biblical sense to me, I have a very difficult time buying into them. Now, we have got over 350 prophecies that were given concerning Christ's first coming. All of those prophecies were literally fulfilled. Now, I would think 
If you could come up with some symbolic prophecies, I would think virgin birth would be one of them. I think that if you said to me prior to the birth of Christ, well, this virgin birth thing, I mean, come on, this is, this is obviously symbolic. Well, even that literally happened. Now, does it make any sense to you? Is it logical? Is it reasonable to you that the same God that would give us over and over again literal promises about the first coming would then all of a sudden shift gears and make all of the prophecies about the second coming to be all spiritual and all symbolic. No, I believe that Jesus Christ will literally come one day. I think that the second thing that we can be absolutely certain of is that the church is not going to experience the wrath of God. Now, you remember back in 1 Thessalonians, as we were going through it in chapter 1, he told them that Jesus has delivered us from the wrath that is to come. Then he says again in chapter 5 that God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Now, We deserve the wrath of God. Now, those of us who are in Christ today, we've got faith in Christ, the wrath that was to be poured out upon us was poured out upon Christ. The righteousness that was upon Christ is then poured out into our life. He got our wrath, we got his righteousness. Now, for us to now suffer the wrath and the judgment of God would make God unfair. Right, We are righteous. By faith in Christ, you are as righteous as Jesus Christ himself. For you to receive the wrath and the judgment of God while being in a state of righteousness would make God an unrighteous God. Now, what this church seems to be a little bit confused about is the timing, the rolling out of all of uh, these promises concerning the second coming. Now, you remember that back in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, that Paul said to the church that there is going to come a day where there is going to be a catching up. Now, the Greek word that he uses there is harpazo, and it means to reach in and to take that which belongs to you. There's something on the table that belongs to you. You're not asking for permission whether you can take it or not. It belongs to you. Nobody's going to tell me when I can take it. It belongs to me. And you reach forth on the table, and you grab what belongs to you, and you take it unto yourself. Well, Paul is telling us there is a day where the church, because we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a day that he is going to reach into this world and he is going to take us unto himself. Now, the Latin word is rapturo. Now, this is where we get this concept of rapture. And you hear, you hear this term, well, the church is going to be raptured out. And you'll hear people say, well, the word rapture is not found in the Bible. Well, not found in the English Bible. It's certainly found in the Latin Bible. And Paul tells us that there is a time where there is going to be this catching up. There is going to be this grabbing a hold of the church. And then he says in chapter 5 that then the day of the Lord will arrive. Now, the day of the Lord is a day that you do not want to experience. It is a day of darkness. It is a day of judgment. It is a day of gloom. And before the day of God comes, the church is going to be taken out. Now, the standard model that you're going to hear in most evangelical churches today is that Jesus came and died on the cross. And there on the cross, he suffered the sin and the shame of all humanity. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. And then he says to the disciples, you wait in Jerusalem to be clothed upon with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you are to take the gospel message to the entire world. Now, for the last 2,000 years, we have been experiencing the church fulfilling the Great Commission. That the church, through different mission operations and through outreach and so forth, the church is taking uh, the, the gospel message to all of the world. Now, how long will this process go on? Will this go on for another 2,000 years? Will it go on for another 2,000 minutes? We do not know. But there is going to be a time in the history of humanity where this operation is going to come to an end. Now, it will be at that point... Where 
where people will then say this tribulation period is now ushered in. And they say that this tribulation period is going to last for seven years, and they neatly divide it into two halves, three and a half years up front and three and a half years at the rear. And then after these seven years, then Christ is going to return again. He will destroy evil uh, from the earth, and the glorious kingdom age is going to be ushered in. Now, where in this standard model that's accepted by most churches today, where in this model do we find the catching up of the church? Well, there are, of course, three schools of thought. There is that pre-trib school of thought that says, well, it's going to happen before the seven years even gets going. And then, of course, you've got the mid-trib, and that's obvious what that is about. And then you have the post-trib that, no, no, everything is going to be completed, and then the church will be caught up and taken away. And so what we have here are these three schools of thought. And we have to remember that in each one of these schools of thought, there is biblical truth. There's biblical truth in all three, and that is why you find people who sincerely love Christ, people who are the followers of Christ, people who are filled with the Spirit, you find them in all three camps because all three camps can look to the Scripture in order to defend their held position, right? Now, the problem that I have begins, first of all, with this concept of the tribulation being seven years long. I personally do not believe the tribulation is seven years long. Now, if you do... Chill out, I'll buy you dinner, all right? I'll buy you lunch, we'll hang out, we'll hug each other, and we'll pray for one another. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are in the same family, not because we agree on the length of the tribulation period. Now, you may or may not be surprised to learn that everywhere we find the length of the tribulation being discussed in the New Testament, it is always discussed in terms of it being three and a half years long. Now, those that promote a seven-year tribulation period say, well, where it talks about three and a half years here, this is the front three and a half years. And where it talks about three and a half years here, it's talking about the last uh, three and a half years. There is not one verse in the New Testament that says that the tribulation period is three or is seven years long. Now, where we get the seven years of tribulation is actually from the prophet Daniel. We're going to go into more detail as we're going through Daniel in our midweek study. But even Daniel says in Daniel chapter 7 that the Antichrist is only going to have power for three and a half years. John utters the same thing in Revelation chapter 13 when he talks about that there was given to it, given to the beast, given to Antichrist, uh, authority for 42 months or three and a half years. Now, what happens in Daniel is that Daniel is a very old man by the time we arrive at chapter 9. Daniel has been in Babylon for 70 years. We're talking about a guy 85, 90 years of age. Israel has ended up in bondage in Babylon. Babylon has since been conquered by the Persians, and so now the Persians are in control of the Jews that have been led into captivity. As Daniel looks at the Jewish community around him, he doesn't see brokenness. He doesn't see any humility. He doesn't see any signs of repentance. There appears from his perspective that the people that have ended up under the judgment of God have not learned their lesson after 70 years. What is God going to do with these people? Maybe God is done with them. Maybe God is finished. Maybe God has had a belly full of these people and all bets are now off. If forget the promises given to Abraham. Forget what he said he's going to do. He is just done. So as we arrive at chapter 9, Daniel begins to pray. What are you going to do? Lord, we're sinful people. What, what is your plan for us? And Daniel receives an angelic visit. And in this angelic visit, he is told, among other things, that 70 weeks, very unusual term, 70 weeks, are decreed. Now, notice it's for your people, 
all right? This is not for the Chinese, right? It's not for the Americans. This is for your people who are who? The nation of Israel and your city. This is not for New York. It is not for London. It is not for Tokyo. It is for the city of Jerusalem. Now, he uses this word weeks here. Now, we have to understand that the Old Testament Jew, that they, their view of weeks was twofold. When you and I talk about weeks, we're talking about, you know, Sunday through Saturday. That's, that's our week. We talk about weeks of days. I say to you, I'll get to it at the end of the week, all right? And so in your mind, you're thinking, well, I'm going to get to it around Thursday or Friday if you're lucky, all right? Now, now Adam Clark gives us this insight. Adam Clark says the Jews had sabbatic years by which their years were divided into weeks of years. As in this important prophecy, each week contains seven years. In other words, for the Old Testament Jew, they had weeks of days, right? They had Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and in those six days, they worked, right? Saturday was their day off, their day of rest, the Sabbath. It's six and one. Six days you work, the seventh day you are off. They also had weeks of years. First year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, sixth year, you worked. Seventh year, you got whole off. I mean, wouldn't it be cool? I mean, every seven years, you get the entire year off. So they had weeks of days and they had weeks of years. So if you were in the Old Testament and you were saying, I'm going to get to it at the end of the week, whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you talking about Thursday or Friday? Or are you talking about four or five years from now, right? You've got to clarify here. So that when Daniel is being told by the angel, there are 70 weeks that are determined. These are weeks of years. 70 times seven is 490. 490 years are determined for your people, your holy city, to finish the transgression to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So here is the prophet. What are you going to do with our people? And the Lord says, all right, here's the deal. Get out your calendar, get out your time clock. This is what I'm gonna do. You have got 490 years. I am gonna work with Israel. I am gonna work with the city of Jerusalem for 490 years. And when I am done after the 490 years, everything that I wanna do is gonna be dealt with and is going to be done. Now, when will the 490 years begin? He says, it will begin when the commandment goes forth from a Persian king for the Jews to be able to go back into the land and rebuild Jerusalem. The Lord said from that point, there will be 69 of these weeks, 69 of these uh, sevens. Uh, there will be 483 years and the Messiah will come. This puts us at about 28 29 AD, somewhere around there, Messiah will come after 483 years, which means there is seven years left on your time clock, seven years left on your calendar. So Daniel, when you hear the commandment from the Persian leader, you guys can go back and rebuild your city, get out your calendar, get out your stopwatch, whatever you're keeping time with, and begin to mark off each day and understand this, 483 years, your Messiah is gonna be here. Now, that leaves just seven years left. So what happens? The Messiah comes. The Messiah comes. And you remember that John, at his baptism, he dunks him there in the water. The Holy Spirit comes upon Christ. And what does the forerunner, what does the man who is anointed with the spirit of Elijah do? He says to Israel, this is your guy. This is the promised one. This is the lamb. This is going to take away the sins of the world, all right? There is about six months now from the time of the baptism till we get to John chapter 2, and Jesus goes to the first Passover in Jerusalem. Then, by the time we get to John's Gospel, chapter 5, he goes to the second Passover, which means by the time we get to chapter 5, the public ministry of the Messiah to the Jews has been up and running for how long? One year and a half. Then in John chapter six, he goes up yet again for the third Passover, which means now the 
Messiah has been public in Israel for two and a half years. And then when we get to chapter 19 of John, he goes to the fourth Passover, which means that the Messiah has been ruling and dealing with the nation of Israel for three and a half years. And what happens? The Messiah is cut off, just like the prophet Daniel said. In the middle of that final week, the Messiah will be cut off. So that leaves how much time left on the prophetic time clock? Three and a half years. That is why everywhere in the New Testament we see the tribulation period being spoken of. It is always a three and a half year period of time. Now, what has happened is, is that this church is under the impression that they are under the wrath of God. And so now what the Apostle Paul has to do is he's got to circle back. Now, we can be very thankful. Once again, we can be very thankful for the misunderstanding of the Thessalonian church because we are going to receive insight concerning the timing and the activity of this final three and a half years that we find nowhere else in Scripture. So we are given insight because of their misunderstanding that the Apostle Paul now has to give further clarification on. Now, I believe that all of us come to the Bible with a bias. We all do it. We all come to the Word of God with an agenda. Whether you've been raised a Baptist, whether you've been raised a Pentecostal, all of us, once we have been a believer for a certain number of years, we think we got it. I mean, there was a time in my life I had it. I'm telling you, I miss those days. There was a day where I knew everything. Uh, don't you miss those days when you knew everything? And, uh, and I remember in those days, in those early days when I knew everything, as I would read the Bible, I would think to myself, now, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. How, how, if, if that is true, then what do I do with this? How, how, in the, how in the world does this deal fit in here? Now, can we just go to the Word of God without our agendas? Let's leave our agendas behind. And let's just read the Word of God for what it says. Again, I get very nervous when we start saying, well, I know that's what it says, but that's not what it means. I get very nervous when we say, well, yeah, that's what that word meant in that verse, but that's not what this word means in this verse. Now, you remember that the Apostle Paul, he wrote to the Corinthians and he said, now, there are not many mighty, right? There are not many noble. I mean, he has taken the weak and the feeble in order that he might confound the wise. Now, I hate to, you know, lay this on you, brothers and sisters, but we are a gathering of the weak and the feeble, all right? That's just, I mean, there are not many mighty around us here. Now, does it make any sense that God would call the weak and the feeble and then give them a list of instructions that only a rocket scientist can understand. That doesn't make sense to me at all, right? I believe that God's plan is a simple plan to understand if we just read what it says. If your book describing the second coming of Christ is larger than the Bible itself, I'm thinking you're making it a little complicated here, all right? And so let's just read what the Apostle Paul says to this confused church now. Let's, let's look at a couple of these verses. First of all, in verse 1, where we read this. Now, brethren, concerning the coming. Now, again, this, this word coming, it's not, a, it's not a verb. It's a noun. It, 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 it's this word parousia. We've had this throughout 1 Thessalonians. We talked about it. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering unto him, we ask you. Now, initially, this appears to be that he's talking about two different things, doesn't it? Now, he, he says here, now, look, I'm, 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 I'm writing you now concerning the parousia, and I'm writing uh, to you concerning our gathering unto him. Now, let me give you just a very, a very quick Greek lesson. Now, in the, in the Greek language, when you have two verbs that are being discussed, and that's what we've got here, that the coming, coming is a verb, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is a verb, and now we have the verb again with the word him there, right? Him, who's him? Well, him is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what the Greek says is that when you've got a situation where you've got a noun uh, that is, is being referred, we've got the noun, Lord Jesus Christ, and we've got the pronoun here, uh, him, and it begins now with the definite article, the, 
right? So you've got a noun that has a definite article in front of it, and then they are connected together with this Greek word that we translate and, it's actually K-A-I. When you have that situation, the Greek grammar is telling us that both of these things are connected together. Both when he talks about the parousia, and he is talking about the gathering, he is talking about the very same event. It is the parousia. Now, it just kills me that there are people that will say, people I respect, by the way, that will say, there, well, there are, there's more than one parousia. Look, it is the parousia. How can you have more than one, all right? If I said it's on the table, you wouldn't think, well, it must be on one of two tables somewhere. No, it's just one thing that I am talking about. He is talking about one thing. He is talking about the arrival, and he is talking about the gathering. Then he says this. He says, now, we ask you not to be so so soon shaken in mind or trouble either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ has come. So this church is very agitated. This church is very upset because they've got three things going on that Paul is hinting to that is causing them to believe that they are in the day of the Lord. See, if they're in the day of the Lord, it means that they have missed the catching up. It means that they are under the wrath of God which of course would ultimately mean that they aren't even saved in the first place. If we are righteous, what are we doing being the recipients of the wrath of God? Now remember, this was a great church and Paul has told them, you're not going to experience God's wrath because God is gonna take you out before the wrath, the day of the Lord comes. Now Paul is saying here that there were three things that were going on. First of all, he says, don't, 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 allow yourself to be troubled by either spirit. So maybe they had some over-aggressive Pentecostal brother or sister, as Pentecostalism tends to lead to, you know, over-enthusiasm, shall we say, where you're saying, thus saith the Lord, when God hasn't spoken. You know, you're kind of taking it on yourself to be a mouthpiece for the Lord. And there were probably those that were saying, thus saith the Lord, this incredible tribulation, and they were under heavy tribulation. They're losing their jobs. They're getting beat up. They're being killed. They're being arrested. Horrible things are happening to this church. And there were probably those that were saying, thus saith the Lord, this is the wrath of God. Paul is saying, don't pay any attention to that. Or by word. This is logos. This is, this is somebody speaking. Maybe they had home group Bible study leaders that were saying, yeah, I'm thinking this is the, the day of the Lord. Look, don't be listening to these guys. Or he says, by a letter as though from us. That there was some counterfeit letter that, see, even the Apostle Paul is saying that, look, this is the judgment to come. Now, even Adam Clark, he says this, the word to be shaken signifies to be agitated as a ship in, at sea in a storm and strongly marks the confusion and the distress which the Thessalonians had felt in their false apprehension of the coming of Christ. This, this is a church that is really shaken up. Now, how shaken up would you be if you honestly believed that you were the recipient of the wrath of God? I mean, here you are, you're thinking you're saved. I mean, here you are, you think you're right with God, and now all of a sudden, the circumstances of life have turned in such a way that you are now being told, this is the wrath of God. You're probably not even saved. Uh, how, how would you respond to a situation where you honestly believed you are no longer a Christian, and you have found yourself in a time of human history where it appears that repentance is an impossibility. How shaken up would you be? That's how shaken up many in this church was. Now, notice how Paul now seeks to comfort. Notice he didn't call them idiots, morons, heretics. Notice he didn't call any names there. Notice what he says in verse three. This is what we'll, this is what we'll zero in on here as we close. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day, right? The day of the Lord, God's judgment, all right? That day will not come unless, right? So you see, the day of the Lord is not imminent. The day of the Lord is not going to happen an hour from now, right? Because he's going to tell us there are trip wires that will have to be tripped before we can say, 
yeah, this might be the day of the Lord, all right? Now, notice what they are. He says that, first of all, unless there is a falling away first, right? That happens first. And, now this is, this is that Greek word, that connection word again, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, we'll, we'll zero in on this guy as we start verse four next time we're together. Now, what Paul is saying is, is that look, you cannot find yourself in the day of the Lord because before the day of the Lord comes, there has to be a rebellion and there has to be a revealing. And if you haven't seen the rebellion and if you have not seen the revealing, you are not in the day of the Lord. Now, again, as I point out, these two events are being connected with this Greek word here that we translate, and it's used in Matthew chapter 4 in verse 2 that Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 These are being connected together. These two things go together. It's used again in Matthew chapter 4, verse 22, when the disciples left the ship and their father, these two things go together. They're leaving both of these things. In Matthew chapter 23, it's used again, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. These, these two groups are being linked together. What he's telling us now is that these two things are being linked together. They're gonna come right on the heels of one another. You're gonna see a rebellion. You're gonna see a departure. You're gonna see people turning their back on the truth of God like never before, and right on the heels of that, you're going to see the revealing of a very, very terrible human being. Now, uh, once again, the Bible Knowledge Commentary tells us this. This revolt, this is a revolt, a departure, an abandoning of a position once held. This rebellion, which will take place within the professing church, will be a departure from the truth of God it ha as, as has been revealed uh, in his word. We are told over and over by the Apostle Paul that there is a scheduled deception coming to this planet, that there is going to be a time where men do not want sound doctrine. There is a time where those who appear to be in the believing community do not want to be confronted with the truth of the word of God. Are we not beginning to see signs of that already? How many people do you know who profess faith in Christ and yet they don't want to be made uncomfortable with what God's word happens to say about a lifestyle cho choice that they have chosen? How many people do you know that want nothing to do with the word of God? How many churches are gathering this weekend and they're not reading the Bible, they're reading some dumb book about leadership or they're, you know, telling stories or, or some, how, how many churches gather together and they, they never say, all right, now let's study what God has said to us. Now look, this falling away cannot happen uh, if the church is gone. Do you understand? This, the, the church has to be present in order for the falling away. Look, I can't fall off the ladder unless the ladder's in the room with me, all right? The ladder's gotta be there if I'm gonna fall off the ladder. I cannot fall away from the believing community if the believing community isn't there in the first place. If the righteous is removed, what in the world am I falling from? What am I leaving? What am I rebelling against if the, the body of truth has been removed from the world? Now, along with, and, and Paul said, look, in the last days, I'm telling you, Timothy, things are gonna get rough. People are not gonna wanna hear what God has to say. Now, right on the heels of this departure from biblical truth, he says there is going to be this man of sin that's going to be revealed. Now, there are men who I greatly respect, men greater than I am, men more spiritual than I am, men uh, that I, I will never be them. I will never be able to attain what they have attend, uh, attained. They are great and incredible brothers in Christ who will say that the church will never see 
Antichrist. And you'll hear them in their sermons say, I am not looking for the Antichrist. I am looking for Jesus Christ. And with that, the congregation begins to applaud because that is an easy message to sell in the United States of America. But what I find interesting is that every early church father that talks about Antichrist always mentions that the church is going to have to deal with this guy to one degree or another. We do not have any early church father that mentions Antichrist and then says, don't worry about it. We're going to be out of here. We're not going to have to deal with that guy. Rather, we have church fathers like Irenaeus that talks about nations giving their authority to this guy, and they're going to give their kingdom to the beast, and they're going to put the church to flight. And after that, they shall be destroyed by the coming of the Lord. Tertullian said the beast Antichrist, with his false prophet, will wage war on the church of God. Justin Martyr said... Two comings of Christ have been announced. The one in which he is set forth as a suffering and glorious, dishonored and crucified, but the other in which he shall come from heaven with glory when the man of apostasy who speaks strange things against the Most High shall venture to do unlawful deeds on the earth against us Christians. Hippolytus said... The 1,260 days, three and a half years, during which the tyrant is to reign and persecute the church. Victorinus says, a little season signifies three years and six months, in which with all his power, the devil will avenge himself under Antichrist against the church. Cyril of Jerusalem said, in his satanic rage and fury, Antichrist will persecute these brave and devout Christians during three and a half, and uh, during the three, the, uh, three years and a half, and torture them with such an extremity of barbarity that he shall deceive the Jews who are expecting the anointed. Augustine said, the kingdom of Antichrist shall fiercely, though for a short time, assail the church. All evangelical leaders that I know of uh, accept an early church document that is known as the Didache. What the Didache was, it was a very early document written maybe as early as 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. It was widely distributed in the church and it was accepted as church doctrine. It was a handbook. It was sort of a new believer's handbook, if you will, just giving us a thumbnail sketch of this is what Christianity believes. And in the Didache, it states that then shall appear the deceiver of the world, talking about Antichrist, as a son of God and shall do signs and wonders and the earth shall be given over into his hands and he shall commit iniquities which have never been since the world began, all right? So the Didache says, Antichrist will come. Then notice in the very next verse, and then, and then shall appear the signs of truth. First, the signs spread out in heaven. There's gonna be some crazy things in the heavens. Sun going black, that old moon turning blood. And then second, the sign of the trumpet. And then notice third, the resurrection. So what is the Didache teaching? The Didache is teaching that look, before the resurrection, the church is going to see this guy. Now look, we are told once again, in chapter 13 of Revelation, that the beast, loudmouth, this is the best name for him, the loudmouth, all right? He's gonna say these boastful things. He's gonna have authority for three and a half years. The reason why he's gonna have this authority is what we read just a couple of verses in front of that, that the dragon is gonna give him the power, give him the throne, and give him the authority. Now, in the chapter before this, in chapter 12 of Revelation, we read that the dragon was angry against the woman. Now, the woman that he is talking about here is the nation of Israel. Chapter 12, the context of chapter 12, it is Israel. Antichrist, with the dragon's authority, is going to go after Israel. We are told in Zechariah that two-thirds of the land of Israel is going to be destroyed. Two-thirds of the Jews are going to be killed. There is a holocaust awaiting the land of Israel today that they are completely oblivious to. 
And there is a holocaust coming in which two-thirds of them are going to be destroyed. There is going to be a remnant of the nation of Israel that is going to be protected. In the rage of the devil, because he cannot destroy the entire nation, he then turns his interest to the offspring of this woman and to those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. These are not atheists, all right? Who has the testimony of Jesus Christ, but those who have a relationship with Christ. Now, I hear people, I, I hear this all the time. And, and again, these are great guys. These are great guys I respect, and, and uh, they, you know, they, they are going to be far more rewarded than any of us here. But I hear them say, and when I hear it, I rub my forehead because my head wants to explode. And I hear them say that, look, the, the, the church is the bride, and Jesus is the groom. Now, what kind of a groom beats up the bride before the wedding? The church is never going to encounter Antichrist because God will not allow his bride to be beat up before the marriage. And I want to say, brothers, do you not realize that the bride is getting the snot kicked out of her now? I mean, do you understand what an American perspective that is? Do you understand that when you get outside the boundaries of the protection of our glorious Constitution that we should all be giving God thanks for today, that when you get outside of the boundaries of that, the church is being butchered. The church is being destroyed. The church is being beaten up. Now, you think about this. We have got sisters in Christ living in East Africa. They are gang raped by Muslims. And then, without any anesthesia, they then have their breasts cut off in case they got pregnant. They're not going to be able to keep that child alive. Now, you ladies, you ladies here, you think about the turmoil. You, you, you think about the, the, the heartache and the trauma that that would that would bring to you. Tell me, tell me what more could the Antichrist do to you that would be worse than that trauma that so many of our sisters in Christ are receiving in East Africa? When you and I talk about that, oh, no, happy days are here again. And we're not, I mean, that old devil, he's not going to be able to touch us. I mean, do you understand that is a very American uh, perspective? that our brothers and sisters around the world are suffering in incredible ways. Now, look, I don't know, I don't know what kind of heartache we have in front of us. I don't know what, what your kids have in front of them or what your grandchildren have in front of them. But I do know this, that John tells us that they overcame. They overcame. Right? You can overcome in the darkest of hour. Now, notice how they overcame. Three things. First of all, the blood of the Lamb. They have a grace relationship with their Creator. They are saved not by church attendance. They are saved not because they give money. They are saved not because they go on mission trips. They are saved because they are trusting in the blood of Christ. They are saved by grace through faith alone. And if you want to stand in your darkest hour, you have to have a grace-based relationship with your creator. Second of all, they, they overcame by the word of their testimony. Do you have a testimony? Do you have a word of testimony? Can you stand before us and give us a testimony of God's personal work in your life? Do you have a personal relationship with the Lord where you can stand before us and you can say, God worked in my life here and God worked in my life there and God did this five years ago and God did this for me yesterday and if God did all of that for me in the past, as I go through this valley of darkness, I know that God is gonna hold me and God is gonna sustain me and God is gonna keep me. If you do not have a word of personal testimony, you're not gonna stand in the hour of trial. And then third of all, they did not love their lives unto death. They allowed the will of God to reign supreme. Whatever God calls upon me to do, I am going to be obedient, even if it means surrendering my life for whatever is well. Now, look, 
I believe that martyrdom is a spiritual gift, all right? I believe it. I mean, I'm telling you, I think about my neck being put on the chopping block and they're telling me to recant. I I could not deny Christ faster. I'm telling you, I know who I am. And if I am ever to remain faithful to God, it is gonna be a miracle. It is gonna be a miracle. And it is gonna be a work of God's spirit in my life. And that's what we have to be praying for. God, you have been at work in my life. You got to keep working. God, do not stop working. Here's not working. I'm in big trouble here. Now, look, understand we may, have, we may have dark hours in front of us. We might have. We might have. It might be thousands of years in the future. I don't know. But I do know this. God has not promised his people a free ride. And we are seeing our brothers and our sisters around the world experience very hard times. And are we better than them? Are we better than them? We're more spiritual than them. We got more faith than they've got. Of course not. Look, God has promised us you're going to have some deep water that you might have to go through in this life. And you're going to make it through that deep water if you trust in the Lord. So let's pray. Let's pray. Whatever comes, whatever comes, we as a people, we're going to be found trusting in the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you that... Um, You have not promised us a bed of roses anywhere in your word. You haven't promised that. But, Lord, you have promised us that you would be with us until the ends of the earth. You have promised us that you would be with us to the end. And even as Paul, the writer of this letter, even as he went through some hardships, you spoke to him and you said, your grace is sufficient. Your grace is sufficient. And your grace got him through that dark hour. And so, Lord, I pray, I I don't know where the pressure is of my brothers and sisters here this morning, but but I pray where that pressure is, they'd be turning it over to you. And they would be asking for your help to manage their marriage, manage their problems at work, manage their problems in their family, manage their problems with their kids or finances, wherever the pressure is, Lord. May they be crying out to you that by your grace, they'd be able to manage. And Lord, we pray that Should the persecution that we're seeing in North Korea, we're seeing now beginning to take root in India, we begin to see it spreading out throughout the Muslim world, we begin now to see it throughout all of East Africa, we we would ask that if the day would arrive that um, that would come to our shores, that, Lord, we wouldn't fold, but that we would make sure that we, we have a grace relationship with you We would make sure that you are personally at work in our life. And we would make sure that we want your will as much as we want anything in this life. Lord, that's your work. And so we pray, complete your work. Give us faith that whatever we have to face in the future, that we as a congregation would be found faithful. Not because we're great, but because you are great, Lord. Manifest your greatness in and through the lives of your people. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.